Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Seeds of Hope. Thank you for joining us tonight, as Nishani and I are going to be talking about a topic that's very crucial, but also a bit uncomfortable. We're going to be speaking about anxiety and depression, and um, Nishani is going to be sharing some insights from her own experience. For those of you who don't know Nishani as yet, she is a TED Talk and keynote speaker. She's a life coach, an author, and she also works in the Global Advocate for Nonviolent Places of Work. And most importantly, just this evening, she is a suicide survivor. Nishani is a mom of a son who survived 22 failed suicide attempts over a period of 10 years. I think at this point, it's very important for me to make sure that you understand that this is not a professional platform and that we are uh, just engaging in a conversation. And if you are suffering from depression or suicidal uh, uh, thoughts, please see the comments below for the Suicide Prevention Helpline. This topic is timely as we now approach the year end and so many people become lonely. Faith-based organizations close their home groups and gatherings, and that leaves many people alone without community or family, and we see suicide rate increasing. This year in particular with the COVID, we've seen more uh, suicide attempts and, and suicide cases um, with being locked down and being alone. And just over the past six months, we've seen about 30% increase in the youth suicides alone. So today as Nishai and I engage in this conversation, we both desire that you are able to draw some strength and inspiration, but most importantly, some hope from this. And so today, Nishani, we are going to be asking you a few questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ishara. And uh, hello, everybody. I'm so pleased to be sitting in the, the other seat today. Thank you for hosting us so that we can have this conversation. Really appreciate your time. Um, so over to you, Ishara. <laughs> okay. Nishani, I think uh, we can start by you just telling us your experience. Yeah, I think, let me start there. I was um, 21 years old and I awoke in, the, in a pool of blood, my own blood. The drip had fallen out of my hand and I was sitting in blood. And as I opened my eyes and, and looked at this, this mess on the floor, which was, which was horrible to look at and to be near, I started to remember what happened. Um, I was in, in a place of work and I had you know, made a mistake and being young, and inexperienced, I thought this was the worst thing ever. I was ashamed of the mistake that I'd made and it was something small and the repercussions that would happen in my family, you know? So I went into the kitchen and I swallowed every bit of chemical cleaner that I could find. Um, and they were in five liter containers and I remember there were quite a few under the sink. And, um, I swallowed it, and the next thing I know, I hit the floor. Um, my, the, the manager of the store at that stage came through and she tried to, she tried to resuscitate me and she tried to um, get me to, to regurgitate um, all the stuff that was, you know, that I had ingested. And a very strange thing happened, Ishara, a very strange thing, because in that moment, that I hit the floor. I remember the sound of my body hitting the floor. And then I remember this lightness as if I, something left and I was floating above my own body and, and the scene. I could hear everything. I could feel everything, but I couldn't, I couldn't communicate. I wanted to tell them, actually, this is a very peaceful place. Please just leave me alone, you know? And it wasn't here nor there, but I could hear the, the woman uh, panicking. I could hear the paramedics saying, we've got no pulse. I saw them uh, stop the escalator and, and carry the stretcher up the escalator into the, into the ambulance. I saw them trying to resuscitate my heart because clearly there was some, some issue on my pulse. Um, 
I didn't feel any agony at that stage. And I, and I even remember when, when the ambulance arrived in the casualty at the hospital and there was a nurse who was rushing and she was so mad. She said, you know, we try to save lives and, and this child is trying to take her life. And, um, and then I woke up. The next thing I woke up, I was in a pool of blood. You know, my throat was burnt. My, my lips were burnt. My skin had darkened. I was lying in the hospital room and I, I kind of had this vague feeling of that's somebody familiar. And it was my mom and it was you, my sister, who had come into the hospital. But they, you know, they had walked completely past me. And I thought, in my mind, in that state, I thought they didn't want me. You know, that's why they were walking past me, that they, did, they were so ashamed of me that they didn't want me. And, you know, it was a very, it was a very difficult time because I was, you know, all, all the religious beliefs also came in and the condemnation and the shame that comes in in that moment to say, you know, this is the worst sin. You are not going to get into heaven. So you'd rather just die and like, this is it for all eternity, you know. Um, and I and I wept. I remember my mom and sister vaguely, but I don't remember any conversations. Um, I just said, God, you know, I, I actually don't know where you are, you know, and, and what's going to happen here tonight. And I expected to be dead by the morning. I really did the way I felt. Um, I wished, I wished I was dead. Let's put it like that. Mm. Um, and I didn't want to face the world, but uh, something happened that night and it, it almost felt like, and I was scared also to be in the hospital by myself, you know, and they, they came a, a sense of like a warm blanket that engulfed me. It felt like a, almost like a child's blanket, but it was tangible. I could feel it as real as I can feel this pen and it held me. And I knew without a shadow of doubt that that was God. He didn't speak. He didn't, there was no great revelation. He just tells me like I was a baby and I, and I fell asleep that night and, um, and I got up feeling much more light in my spirit for some reason. Um, and that, oh, I even failed at a suicide. <laughs> <laughs> Failures. I have many failures in my life. I couldn't even get that right. <laughs> oh, Nishani, I'm so glad that you find the funny in this. <laughs> um, I do remember that evening so well. And um, from our point of view, what had happened, because we know that you were at work and uh, mom got a phone call to say, well, Nishani has attempted suicide and she's being rushed to the hospital. And um, our parents didn't have a vehicle. And so we had to arrange for our, to get there. And so we couldn't all as a family come there. But I remember that my mom and I came along and as we were coming to the hospital, uh, we were talking, what could have caused this? What could have went through her mind that she, she do this? And to be honest, I remember that evening so clearly as I walked into the hospital, I walked right past you. Yeah. because I could not recognize you. Uh, your skin was darkened uh, and, and, and I walked right past you. Uh, and eventually I turned around and, and I looked and I saw you, but I remember looking at you and I saw that your lips were burnt, uh, that all, all here was dark, your whole skin was dark. Um, and you just sat there uh, in your bed, hopeless in a, in a very low, low state. Not the Nishani we see tonight, but in a state of, of loneliness and darkness. And I could see the shame on your face as well. Uh, and so Nishani, can you just put us in more perspective by telling us the circumstances around this experience? What led you to, to actually go ahead and do this? Yeah. What drew you to this point? Um, so, I mean, we, we had been going through a lot at home and... Um, you know, I, I must say I've been raised in an exemplary family. I, I don't, I, this, is, this, is, this is on me. It's got nothing to do with my upbringing or my family. But, you know, I felt the pressure of being the eldest child. I felt the responsibility. Um, I uh, sort of uh, come out of college to kind of uh, help support the family. And um, it was, 
it was difficult. We were 10 people at home. My grand and my aunt lived with us. We were six kids and two adults' parents. And I was the, the, the sort of the sole breadwinner. My parents had a little business. And I felt that pressure suddenly, and it was too much. And the fact that I could possibly lose this job, that I could possibly lose this job meant like my family, I would be letting down my family, you know, and I didn't want to let down my family. I knew, we, we knew what it was like to live below the bread line. Um, I understood that and I knew that firsthand. And I, I just felt like I cannot do this to my family, you know. So the fact that I had made a mistake or that I had jeopardized my work in any way uh, meant that there was shame. And, you know, we were also raised, this was 30 years ago now, you know, almost. And, yeah. you know, we were raised, yeah, we were raised in a culture and in a society where, you know, people always worried about what would the neighbors say or what would people think, you know? And what would people say? And, you know, your father's reputation is on your head and you know, all kinds of crazy things that we say to, our, to ourselves or say in our communities. And so I felt this pressure of like, oh my word, this is, it was too much. And in that moment, it wasn't premeditated. I hadn't been thinking for months about swallowing that stuff, but I thought this was the only way out. I thought this was the only solution. Yes, okay. And Nishai, many people who battle with depression and suicide thoughts uh, have this perceived idea of what um, their truth is. Yeah. But what did you find uh, as you engaged with your family? Did they actually uh, have that shame over your head? Uh, did they actually expect uh, all of this from you that, that you put on yourself? Uh, would you like to share that? No, they didn't. In fact, you know, I remember my younger sister saying, uh, uh, you know, she, she said she prayed so hard for me that night that I would make it. I remember her saying, she said, Ashanti said, you know, she said, I wish I could have taken your place because I didn't want you to go, you know. And, you know, when, when you realize, sorry, I'm getting a bit emotional. When you realize how loved you are and you realize how treasured you are, um, you know, you, you, you think like, oh my gosh. But, but you know, suicide is a funny thing because my act of suicide was actually in my head. I made it out to be like this was an act of love to them because they would be better off without me. And that's how I justified my actions, which was completely incorrect. My perception, my reality was completely incorrect. You know, I, I was loved. Let me not... There was no mistake about that, but, um, but my reality and in those moments, I was completely uh, in a space of condemnation. I think the moment you give the enemy that little foothold, he just takes it. He just takes yes. it. And then you yes. go into the condemnation and the shame cycle. And then suddenly what you're thinking about doing is, is not justifiable. It makes sense. It yeah. is such a strange scenario you know yes yeah, yeah. yeah. Charming, did you go for counseling or um, some help for uh, after that experience you know it was a time i mean the hospital did offer the hospital did offer it was a time 30 years ago that we didn't have language for this Ashara. we didn't have language for this we were not brought up with therapists or occupational therapists or educational psychologists or career counsels or any kind of counseling. We knew the church. Uh, we knew um, that, that type of counseling. But in a nutshell, no, I don't think I did. I think I, I wept a lot. I screamed a lot. I probably had many fights with my mother. Um, she was very gracious uh, to me. But uh, it, uh, no, I don't think I, I, I dealt with those, whatever the trauma and the pain was or the pressure. No, I didn't. I didn't really go for counseling. By not dealing with it, did it resurface in your life again? Yeah. yeah. It did resurface. Uh, uh, you know, years later when I was going through different circumstances and through, through some trauma, 
uh, whatever that pain was, that shame cycle would just surface again. Um, I went through some, some really crazy things in my marriage and, and even in my parenting life. And, um, you know, even to date, um, I have cave moments. I, I have friends, very close friends, who uh, I can phone and say, I'm going into the cave, you know. Uh, and they understand that language for me because they've journeyed with me for over 10 or 20 years. Um, they understand that language for me and they will say to me, that's okay, you can do it today, but tomorrow you've got to get up, you know. And uh, so they do check in on me. Uh, there was a time it was really bad. Um, and, I, and, and I got completely paralyzed almost in my body, you know, and I couldn't move. Um, and that is when a friend of mine, Ranjini, she would come every day um, and she would make sure that I've, I've eaten. And I think my son was with you for that week. Uh, but so I was just completely alone in this house and completely just lying flat on the floor and I couldn't move. And, you know, she would come every day, took the, hit the knives, took the medication, you know, made sure I was okay. And I did have to deal with it. And I did have to go for counseling. And I did have to go to, for meds um, in certain periods of my life. Yes, yes. And so from your experience, you have surrounded yourself with people who you can call upon and can trust with your deepest feelings. And so often people who are battling with uh, these thoughts somehow try to go away from people mm. and then it get worse and worse. And so by listening to you, I can just hear that the people around you are able to lift you up by you sharing with them or also allowing you to have those mellow moments as well. Yeah. Nishani, um, what are your views about medication uh, in terms of uh, these anxiety and depression thoughts? Yeah, you know, my, my son is uh, on uh, four psychiatric medications. He's a recovering addict and uh, he's on schedule seven medication. And I always say to people, if your child or if your loved one or if you have diabetes, will you leave it untreated? Will you leave it untreated? If you see your child lying on the floor and going into a di diabetic coma because their blood sugar has gone low or something's happening to them, you're gonna get on that phone, you're gonna phone the ambulance, you know, you're gonna do what needs to be done, you know? And so it's the same with mental illness. It's the same with depression. It's the same with anxiety. Because we don't see it and you see this strong individual, and I am strong, I, I, I do, 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 do own that. But because you see that, it doesn't mean that there isn't inner battles going on. You know, I always say, check up on your strong friends. Check up on your strong friends, you know? Um, so medication, there's a time and a space for it. Um, thank God I'm not on medication now. I've, I've done a lot of work. I'm, I'm working on many things. Um, and, you know, God's been faithful in, in the healing process for me. But I can't say that I'll never be on medication because there might come a season in my life that I need it. And I'm, and I'm very open to that. Yes. I think that what you say is so good uh, because on the physical uh, ailments, when you're sick, you pop a pill, you go yes. to the doctor, as you said, and you get yourself sorted out uh, to help yourself physically. But the mental illness is something which is all in your mind and something more um, deeper inside. But as you said, we also need to get that kind of help. Okay. We do. And you sorry. Mm. sorry. We do, Ishara. And you know, we also need to, to make it normal. We need to normalize it. You know, mm. we can't, we can't be, be, be making funny jokes about, oh, she's loopy or she's like this or, or whatever it is in the families or in, in communities. We've got to just normalize it, absolutely normalize it and take away the fact that, you know, this whole disease or this whole uh, not treating this is uh, rooted in shame and uh, condemnation. And I'm sorry, when you know who you are in God, there's no place for that. Yeah. I think that you said a very good thing, you know, we've got to unlearn some of the things that we have picked up as we are growing up and from communities. And we've got to reassess uh, what we are thinking. We've Ooh. got to think about what we're thinking. We've got to think about what we are saying. And uh, that's so true, Nishani. 
uh, you spoke about your son. Uh, so would you like to uh, talk more about uh, his uh, suicide attempt and why he did this? And yes, if you can just address that. Yeah, so I am also the mother of a child who has survived by the grace and the mercy of God, 22 overdoses. Um, Joshua was in 10 years of active addiction and uh, he survived it and like I said, it's only grace and mercy, real mercy. Um, how do I deal with that as a mother? I deal with it by trying to be as open as possible with my children to talk about this, these issues. Um, I am a woman of faith and a woman of God, but faith in itself is naive. We cannot just pray this away. God is not going to, and God, it, God does do it. He does miraculously heal people at if you're one of those people, I, I absolutely agree. It can happen. It did not happen for us, and it does not happen for us yet. You know, we've had to do the hard work as a family, Shara. We've really had to do the hard work as a family. You know, um, the, the reason that we are depressed is that we have no way to express uh, some deep-rooted uh, pain or some deep-rooted trauma or something that is, that is, um, that is a, a trigger for us. That is a trigger for us. And, you know, we have, we've had to do a lot of work around what are those triggers, around counseling, around coaching, around being physical. How do we keep physical? How do we have these open conversations? He has a, uh, we have a, a contract between us, you know, uh, that we've, we've had this conversation, not a physical paper contract, but a, a contract where he says, mom, if there's a trigger, this is what we need to do, you know? So, um, it's about owning it. It's about accepting it. And it's also about saying, hey, you know what? Um, that is Joshua's journey and this is my journey. And he's got to own his part and I've got to own my part. I think one of the mistakes I made as a mom is that I tried to save him. I tried to make it right for him, you know? And until he started fighting for himself, it, nothing changed, you know? And, and it was hard work, Ishara. It was hard work. It was three months of intensive counseling, of intensive rehabilitation, three or four times of counseling a day, physical activity, group activity. I mean, he's got about 10 to 12 journals, which I hope he will put into a book one day, but 10 to 12 journals of his, of his work. Uh, so as a young man, he has had to do that work, and I've had to push that. Um, so that we can come to a place, thank God, he's three and a half years okay now and we don't have that issue. But we still have medication that helps us. Yeah. Nishani, uh, what um, was the root cause of Joshua trying to uh, commit suicide and so many attempts, not just one? I know I'm in, uh, in the area of education and I work with uh, teenagers and um, Joshua was very young when he uh, attempted these uh, suicides. Uh, um, and tell, tell us, can you tell us what was, why, why did he keep on trying to yeah. end his life? Yeah. So uh, we, we come from a, a very uh, a difficult background where my children have lived through 13 years of abuse. And the first time Joshua tried um, drugs, he was trying to numb his pain. He re somebody told him at some drug ed talk at school that it's the best painkiller, you know? Uh, so in his young mind, in his naive mind, he thought, oh, okay, this can numb my mind and I can, you know, I can go out there and just numb this pain. And so he, and then he went missing, you know, for, the, for, for two whole days. I mean, you'll remember that time. And when he came home, he, he sat on my bed and he said, mom, I'm on heroin, please help me. And uh, so that in itself was, um, was a shock to any system. It's enough to get any mother depressed right again. But, um, you know, the fact that he was able to sit there and look me in the eye and say, Mom, please help me. This is where I'm at. I'm very grateful for that. Mm -hmm. You know, even though it wasn't something that I wanted to hear. And that's important for parents and for teachers. You know, sometimes it's something you don't want to hear. You want to go like, you know, 
Yeah. And my first reaction, Ishara, was like, oh, it's not him. It's his friends. It's this. It's that. It's bad company. I should move house. I should do this. I should do that. And, you know, it took me a long time to let him own that. To let him own that. Yeah. You know, Nishani, I remember very clearly uh, one incident where uh, you and I uh, went through certain parts of Johannesburg that I wouldn't normally drive through. In fact, you were driving <laughs> and I was in the passenger seat and we we're handing out um, a lunch packs to uh, people on the street, but mainly uh, drug addicts, you know, uh, just destitute and um, haven't eaten for days some yes. very uh, beautiful young people on the street. Mm. And I remember how you went from place to place and you said, have you seen my son? Uh, have you heard anything? And I looked at you and I just said, God, she's so desperate to mm. hear something, whether her boy is alive or dead, whether he is uh, okay. And, you know, uh, you haven't seen him for so long. And my heart just broke as a mom as well uh, to what was going on here. And uh, how did you cope with this, uh, Nishani, uh, with all these years that he tried to be away from home? He tried these suicide attempts. Yeah. And how did you cope with that? Yeah, firstly, I must say that um, we still do that. We still go out and do that. Uh, these drug addicts uh, on the street. Um, and one of the things that I, I did to, to cope with those years, you know, you don't think about it when you're going through it. Um, I must say having a, a younger child, Jared, um, uh, forced me to stay alive almost. I might have slipped my wrists. <laughs> there were some really difficult times in those years. And so, you know, it's, it's, it wasn't without difficulty. It wasn't without um, a low prayer um, and it wasn't without you know at some point there was counseling there was coaching there was medication um, I also found for me personally that finding some purpose in this space and in this time I was very determined to not be named or, or not be labeled as the drug addict mom that lost her plot you know I wanted to have purpose and purpose pushed me uh, because I knew somebody was waiting for me. You know, I didn't have, have money to, to plan, you know, spa days or uh, trips or holidays or something to look forward to, you know, because they say if you have something to look forward to, it gives you, it pushes you in a certain direction. I didn't have that. But what I found was I started to do community work and project work and that gave me passion and that gave me purpose. And I knew that, no matter what was going on in my life, somebody was waiting to meet me. Somebody, I could make a difference somewhere, you know? Mm -hmm. And that coupled with the support that I received for, for fears and anxiety, um, that helped me to push through. It helped me to push through that. And I promise you, the, the power of praying with family and community, it, it, you cannot underestimate that. I have mm -hmm. heard the voice of God when I was looking for this child, say, turn left, turn right. And I know that it was um, just because I was carried in so much prayer. Yes. I mean, Joshua's story is an absolute miracle uh, to think about the places that you drove and I drove with you and the places that you showed me where he was living, guarded by all of these uh, dealers and so on. Quite scary. And uh, yes, you did go through and found places. Uh, amazing stuff, Nishani. And so uh, wonderful that you fought for your both the boys, not yeah. just one, but you fought for both your boys and for yourself yeah. and for yourself as well. And that's amazing to find something to fight for. Um, and you mentioned your project works and uh, finding a greater purpose and giving off yourself. Um, I remember that uh, the work that you did in El Dorado Park and Soweto, amazing work. And I know that I came once with you uh, where you did a feeding scheme as well as upskilling and so on. And I remember that it was such a busy day and so many people were being helped and we had computer classes for the yes. uh, teenagers and we had uh, 
classes for the uh, students to come and do their work and talks and it was just an awesome day but what stood out for me and i think that i will forever remember this it was a gentleman that came up to me while you were very busy uh, and he said to me do you understand what your sister has done for me and uh, I said, no, I don't. And he said to me, I was on drugs. I was so involved in drugs and I messed my life up and I messed my family's life up. And until he sought the help uh, through your um, uh, drug coaching as well as the help of God. And he said that he's a changed man and he's now investing and going back into the prisons to help many other young men who are experiencing that. And at that point, Nishani, Joshua was still not home. Uh, at that point, <laughs> Joshua was still on the streets, no. still doing drugs. And I just thought to myself, it's amazing that you are pushing on in spite of your own pain, in spite of your own uh, heartache that you are experiencing. And I think that is something that we are touching on that's important, is that you're giving off yourself. Uh, and then the, it's, it's not just only on self, but your focus becomes on a greater good as well. I think it's important to find a cause and to find a calling. Um, mm -hmm. I think I, I've got a very stubborn streak in me. Um, and I was quite adamant that I was going to have a life and I was going to be happy. And that I didn't, I didn't cause whatever, you know, Josh was going through. And yeah, it was 10 years of, of heartache and, and, you know, have, not having him home, not knowing where he was going to die or be alive or dead or when the phone would ring, you know. But um, I, I think, you know, when you find who you are in God and you understand your identity in him and that you understand that you are called for a purpose, then all you have to do is avail yourself. Because in those moments, I was completely weak. I'm not sure how I showed up. Uh, I, I'm not sure <laughs> what I looked like even. But I know that God moved. And for that, I am grateful. Because, you know, we had almost 200 kids reunited with their families. We had 65 people moved into rehabs. There was amazing work that was happening. Like you said, it was a busy, busy, busy time. But, you know, that I cannot take credit for because when we are weak, he is strong and his strength is made perfect in our weakness. And I don't want to come across as all spiritual and, 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 and over holy. I'm speaking from lived experience. I'm not speaking because I just want to throw the scriptures out at you. You know, sometimes Ishara, you know, one of the most unhelpful things, um, one of the most unhelpful things that I've, that I've had happen to me when I, when, you, when you're in your cave and when you're upset or depressed or whatever it is, you know, some of the most unhelpful things that people say to you is, oh, just be strong. Oh, just get over it. Um, oh, but you're such a strong girl. Oh, but you give so much to so many people, you know? And, and, and in those times, all I want to do is like crawl up in a fetal position and just cry. And, you know, some of the most helpful things that I've heard from people and from beautiful souls have been actually, and I, and, I, and I say this to people now, it's like, actually, uh, it's okay. You can cry. It's okay. Mm. I see you. It's okay. Mm. I hear you, you know, mm. and actually you don't have to be strong. You actually don't even have to pray. It's okay. I've got you. God's got you. And you know what? I'm going to stand in the gap until you can stand up on your feet again. I'm going to wait for you and I'm going to tarry with you and I'm going to pray and I'm going to, to go to the doctors with you and I'm going to do, I'm going to check if you've had a counseling session and I'm going to do what I need to do to journey with you. But you don't have to be strong right now. It's actually okay. I'll do it for you. I'll hold the space for you. And I think that's very important today is that we learn to hold the space for each other. Yes. I think that what you just shared is very valuable, Nishani, because many people don't know how to support somebody in this uh, space. Uh, it's because we've been, we're unsure and we often, as you said, saying the things that we should not be saying. Um, and I think that what you just said, just walking along with them, and I'm reminded of a scripture in the Bible which says that tears are liquid words. And so sometimes we may not have verbal words to express 
what we are feeling and the, and the, and the sadness we are feeling. But these tears are liquid words. Yeah. And I do believe that God stores up every tear and he sees everything. Yeah. Nishani, what would you say to somebody who has uh, lost their parent uh, through suicide? And now, uh, as they're growing up, they are battling with these thoughts themselves. So what would you say to somebody like that? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very difficult one because, you know, children then have, um, firstly, you know, it's very sad to, to lose a parent through suicide. You get robbed of that parent. And as a child, often you blame yourself, you know. So firstly, I would say it's not your fault. Um, and, and the second thing I would say, you are not rejected. You are not orphaned. You are not rejected. Your parent did not leave you because it was, you know, they couldn't stand to be with you or didn't want to, didn't love you enough. Like I said, sometimes it just feels like, oh my gosh, you know, this is the best thing for the family at the moment. Um, and the other thing is that as much as your parent has gone through it and it might be justifiable in your mind, um, it's not okay. You're your own person. We all go, we all have childhood trauma in our 40s or 50s that we, we have to deal with. Whatever the situation might be, we all have childhood trauma. And so I'm saying to you that it's important to acknowledge that, um, but we've got to own the responsibility for our own lives and our own healing ourselves. Uh, it's not okay to just say, because that happened in my childhood, this is how I'll behave because I was raised without a dad, therefore I can behave like this. Or because I saw violence in my home, I can be violent. And no, it's not okay. We have to break the cycle. We have to stop it. And if you are listening to this, then it's important because this is something that you need to do in your generation, in this lifetime. And um, have the audacity to want to be happy. Have the audacity to fight for yourself, you know? Um, because there is richness and fullness in a life uh, filled with God. Yeah. Yes. Um, Nishani, um, I know uh, I've come to your home many times, and so I see as soon as you enter your garden, uh, Joshua has uh, a little stone that he has a saying on it. I just want, I don't know if you want to share that with the viewers and tell them why he has that. Yeah, so he was, he was in a, in a long-term rehab for 11 months. Um, it was 2014 at that time. And uh, he was in um, uh, Nelspreet, is that right? Healing Wing, yeah, Nelspreet. And uh, he was away for 11 months at that time. And um, it was a time where he had to come to a place of being able to fight for himself. And so there's a lot of slate stones there that... Um, uh, on the road and because he was away from home for so long he wrote on the slate stone he said i fight for myself you know and he put it put a put a heart on there and uh and so you know that is still in our garden as a reminder um because we all have to fight for ourselves and as much as god has done the work you know you have to also be brave enough to look eyeball to eyeball with your emotions with your pain with your trauma, um, because I promise you, you won't die. You won't die if you look eyeball to eyeball with your pain and your rejection. Yeah, yeah. And so something to, to have a visual, to yeah. have that in front of you as a reminder uh, that you are fighting for yourself, even in those times when things seem to be going so wrong and when you're hearing the worst of news and you're feeling depressed and lonely, you're walking outside and you're having that visual up there in yeah. a spot which is going to remind you that you have come from there, from that low space, and you have come out of it and you are reminded that you are fighting for yourself. Yeah. Um, Nishani, you said that you and your family have done a lot of work and journaling. Um, and I know that you're also a journaler. Uh, uh, what, um, what is so good about journaling? Journaling in itself is therapeutic because it's no judgment. Nobody gets to see it. You can write as you feel. Um, it, it comes out. Somehow it comes, it's, it, you know, it's stuck in there and it just comes out. It's not the only method or the only tool. Um, 
it worked for me. It's worked for one of my sons. It hasn't worked for the other one, who um, who will just want to you know, write write long stories. Not that kind of person. So you've got to find something that that works for you. Um, I think it's important as a family. Uh, we have the fact that we kind of coexist under the same home together. We've had to journey on forgiveness. We've had to have some critical conversations. Uh, we've had to also uh, say to each other, uh, when you do this, I feel unsafe, you know, or, or set some boundaries. So these are difficult conversations to have with young men. Um, and, uh, but, but we've had to, we've had to push forward because uh, how else would we have be coexisting in the same home? Um, having been through 10 years of trauma, all the hurt, all the pain, all the attacks, you know, um, yes. it's, been, it's been quite difficult. Yeah. Shani, you touched on something very important, and that is forgiveness. Uh, so we're just going to talk about forgiveness. Firstly, when you attempted your own suicide uh, those years back, were you able to forgive yourself? How did you move past yeah. that? I don't think it was it was an instant thing. I had to, you know, I had to work through it. I had to go under discipleship. And I had to uh, learn to do that. Um, and I mean, there were many, many people in our youth groups and our church groups at that stage who journeyed with me, who, who are still in contact with me now, actually. Um, and for that, I'm very grateful. But I mean, self-forgiveness is, um, it's hard. It's hard. I've had to, you know, to, to be able to forgive yourself for, for causing pain to, to yourself and to others, it's not easy. Um, but there is, there is grace, there is real grace, yeah, yeah. And so what does forgiveness bring? Why, why is it such an important thing to be able to forgive yourself, to be able to forgive uh, people, to be able to forgive, uh, why, why is it such a crucial thing in a journey to recovery? It gives, uh, it gives freedom, complete freedom. It gives complete freedom, Ishara. It, it, uh, it releases you. It releases the other person. Um, one of the things that I, that I uh, endeavor to do is I endeavor to live so wholeheartedly and free. Um, so I, I want to remain soft in this world. I don't want to be hardened by what, what life, what, you know, some of the circumstances that I've gone through in life. And they have been tough. Um, and so I want to live soft. I want to live with a new heart, a heart of flesh and not a heart of stone. I want to be able to listen to the Holy Spirit. I want to be able to do what God tells me to do. And that for me is um, something that you have to deliberately do. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. And what happens to somebody who uh, has been having these suicidal thoughts but refuses to go for counseling? What advice would you give the family members, firstly, who are supporting that person? They are scared. They're not sure how to approach this. And the person is refusing to go for any counseling. Yeah. Ishara, firstly, let me just, say, just make this very clear. Is that when one person is going through this and they have attempted suicide and failed, this is not th that person's problem. They are not the one with issues. This is a family problem, you know. And it's like, you know, it's like when you take a, when you're cleaning a fish tank and you take the fish out and you put in a little bowl of water and you have to clean the tank out and then you put the fish back in the fresh water. Now, if you take the person out and they go to for psychiatric help and counseling and all that, and they go into the clean water, but you haven't cleaned the tank, you're going to put that clean fish right back into the dirty water and they're going to die, you know? And so it's, it's like that with family. Um, if a person is going through something and has attempted suicide, firstly, don't tiptoe around them. It is on their mind all the time. It is something that they are thinking about. Uh, they have the shame story, maybe, maybe not. They have the rejection story. They also have the story of like, woe is me and, you know, please play the violins and feel sorry for me. Um, that's all going on all at the same time. So if you don't address it, talk about it, create a safe space, uh, how, will, how will you work through this? And, you know, if it means that me as a mom has to deal with some things because I'm not going to like some stuff that I'm going to hear from my child, because my, I might have caused the trauma. In my case, I stayed 13 years in an abusive marriage. I was part of causing my children's pain. 
you know. And so I have responsibility for that. And we had to have these conversations. He said to me, but mom, you stayed. You were part of causing my pain. And, and I had to say, I am so sorry. And I had to ask for forgiveness, you know. And um, so it's, it's part of the process that you work as a unit, whoever is around that person, whatever is going on. This is not something somebody can deal with on their own. This is a family or a community or a societal, whether it's your friend group, church group, whatever it is. Um, this is not something to be, you know, like, because then again, you, you blame me and shaming, oh, that person's got issues. And so, you know, they must go and sort themselves out. It doesn't work like that. Mishani, I'm just thinking also about people um, who have their family and they have been going through depression and they have spoken about this to their family, but they always seem to be in a depressive state. Yeah. And as you said, they also seem to say, woe is me all the time. Yeah. And um, their family members almost seem, or friends, uh, are seem to be coming uh, worn down mm. with uh, this um, conversation. Yeah. And uh, so what, what, do you, what would you say about that situation? Yeah, uh, don't, don't enable it. Don't enable it. You know, it's very difficult to be going through something like that. And it is very easy to be like, woe is me. And, and you know what happens is that people, um, and generally, and, and I'm speaking from my personal experience, is that uh, you get addicted to drama, you know? Get addicted to the high of drama, you know, like something's going to go wrong, the phone's going to ring, you know, like this person's going to do some hectic stuff, you know? So, so everybody starts walking around eggshells around that person. Um, and I, uh, and I mean, it's something that I experienced with my own children. And eventually I just said to him, like, uh, you know, um, if this is your choice and this is how you choose to end your, you know, to go out in the world, go out of this world, um, I'm going to have to respect that. And, you know, because it stopped the manipulation, it stopped the enablement. It was a very difficult conversation to have. I'm a mom. I'm a mom. And, um, but I had to, you know, I had to say to myself, like, you know, I'll give you your pity party. Like, like my friends in the cave have said, and like I've contracted with them, let me have my pity party because I am a drama queen of note. Please let me have my, my pity party. But tomorrow, check that I've got, I've got my big girl Brooks on and I'm doing life and that I've gone to God with this um, uh, because, because, you know, he will direct me. But, but that I've, I, I, you know, that there's a time limit to this. To this. Otherwise, I might never wake up from the cave and I might be quite depressed and quite overweight and quite like, you know, nobody would want to be around me because like then, you know, this is who I am and I'm being defined by this. You know, you don't, you don't go every, everywhere and say, oh, I'm diabetic and, and blah, 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 blah. You don't define yourself by your illness or anything like that. You define yourself by your identity in Christ. And, um, and that's it. So, as much as you have loved ones, as scared as you might be, and I'm not saying be uncompassionate. Please don't, don't hear me wrong. You have to be compassionate. You need to be understanding. But at the same time, you cannot enable that person because you'll get caught in the drama. And before you know it, you'll be, you'll be like supporting this uh, violent playing depressive state, which is, um, which is manageable. What is uh, sometimes people in your own family or in your own space is the reason that you are trying to commit suicide? Mm -hmm. You know, there are sometimes family members uh, uh, who are actually the reason that you are trying to, to end it all. Uh, how does a person approach this? Um, yeah. Please tell somebody. Just take that first step. If you have to commit to one thing, tell somebody, there is somebody, there's a teacher, there's a work colleague, there's even the, the South African depression, depression, there's focus on the family, there's so many, so much out there. 30 years ago, we didn't have this much resources, you know, there's so much out there. Please just tell one person, you know, and if it, if you are in a situation where you're scared to be at home or you, or, or the, the, you know, you, you find that there's no way out, 
there is always a way out. You have to speak about this. I mean, we've seen gender-based violence. We know that people end their lives because it's too much to bear. Um, but just tell somebody, tell somebody. And if that person doesn't listen, tell somebody else, you know, um, yeah. because somebody will journey with you. And you've got to make that commitment to own this, that this mm -hmm. is not going to own you. Yes. This is not going to own you. You are going to own this and you're going to overcome this, yes. you know? Um, and so uh, tell somebody, yeah. That's such a good advice, Nishani, because I'm just thinking uh, some years ago uh, in my teaching career, we lost a student and he was only in grade eight yes. um, where he committed suicide. And, you know, uh, he had actually failed grade eight and mm -hmm. he said to his parents that he's not going to come back same school and uh, his parents were gone off on a business trip and he was left alone in the house and uh, he did this but I know my friends and I my, my work colleagues and I are forever traumatized by that yeah. because I wish that he had come to one of us yeah. and said ma'am this is what I'm experiencing I will be experiencing shame I'll be experiencing uh, hurt and heartache and the, the pressure of finding new friends and I could have told him that it is just a small thing in your life, that your marks is not the end of the world. Even now, when I'm teaching, you know, I just say to students, I teach a very difficult subject, a very challenging subject, that sometimes students are working hard, but they're not achieving what they hope for. And I just keep on saying to them, it is not the final thing. No. You know, there are many people who don't uh, do as well, but they find their purpose and uh, they get going. So I, I wish I could just say to him, you know what, it would be better. Yeah. Talk to us. We could have engaged the parents as well. We could have got the family back together if he had just spoken. And uh, uh, that's it, absolutely wonderful what you're saying. Speak about it to somebody because there is help. There, is, there are people who are willing to listen. Um, and I think that's excellent advice. Yeah. And if you're contemplating it, you know, just wait. Wait till tomorrow. Just mm -hmm. sleep on it. Wait one wait. more day. Wait one yes. more day. Wait one more day. Wait till tomorrow. To lose. You've got nothing to lose by trying nothing to sleep. Nothing to lose. Work. One more day, you know, one more day. And, you mm -hmm. know, Ishara, I just want to say to you as well, it hasn't always been easy to talk about this. You know, when, you, when you've got uh, teenagers and you've got life and, I mean, I've had many jobs and all at the same time and, you know, you're busy and all of those things. It's not easy to sit down. And, and I must say, and I'm, and I'm generalizing, I'm not saying this is the case for everybody, but I'm just saying, you know, generally guys don't sit eyeball to eyeball and have a conversation with you about how they're feeling. In fact, mm -hmm. most men don't even have, uh, vocabulary. When I came into the space of uh, coaching, I had to write an emotional vocabulary and say, oh, happy, sad, glad, mad. Oh, this is what it feels like in my, in my body. Because I had, no, I had no idea what that felt like, you know. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I've done with my children uh, quite deliberately is that I've, um, I, I, we walk the dogs or whatever. I've taken them on dates to Mug and Bean for a milkshake or a coffee. Um, we also um, try and do some nature walks. I know it's not always possible, but, you know, South Africa, we've got many places that we can go to that are almost free, you know, um, and, and you teach lessons. It's like, don't be so hard on yourself that, you know, we've got to have a session now. We've got to talk about the serious stuff because let me tell you guys, just run for the hills the moment you say, I want to talk. That's just given. And so, you know, you've got to find ways. And, and you know, one of the, the nicest things that I used to do was I used to take them on drives and then like, Put the buttons down and then they're trapped in the car they can't go anywhere you know so so we would have some conversations um but not eyeball to eyeball and generally it was just snippets and little things so as a as a as a parent i would say or as a you know somebody who loves somebody who's going through this that find ways i mean i've i've even taken you know paintball bullets and all kinds of things to to try and be a part of what he was involved in so that I could have inroads into his life. Because suicide yeah. happens and everybody notices. It's all the things that lead up to suicide that we don't notice. That we don't notice, yes. That we don't notice. So notice, start noticing around you. We are going into the festive season, guys. Watch those social media posts. Look who's not okay. Uh, pick up the phone, send a message. Um, 
you know, it's a very, very difficult time to be alone. It's a very difficult time uh, if people don't have a lot of family. Um, troll, troll that social media. I use social media quite proactively to check up on people and to make sure. And I'm not shy to put a, put a message to say, I saw your post. I'm not happy. Are you okay? Mm -hmm. uh, because you know what? They can tell me, bugger off. Or they can actually say, hey, thanks for noticing. Mm -hmm. And I do almost daily. You know, I do that almost daily. So for me, um, I, I don't have to be in people's lives all the time. Uh, but I'm noticing. I'm noticing all the time. I'm noticing. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying. I mean, we don't always get it right. But, uh, but, but we do try. Yeah. You know, I'm also just thinking about my own personal experience. As you said, uh, there's all the things that lead up to uh, the suicide. And uh, for me, I just remember a time when I was around grade eight and grade nine. And you know that uh, we had a very happy family, mm -hmm. a very big, happy family. That, and yeah. uh, although I was number four in the family, I was treated very much like the youngest. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, loved and, 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 and cared for so much by uh, my older siblings and parents and family. Uh, but uh, uh, when I was around grade eight, I had lots of thoughts of suicide. And I don't, I'm not sure if it was hormonal, the hormonal changes that you are experiencing, or was the time that as, um, in my younger years that I was very much uh, bullied for um, not being able to speak clearly. I had a huge stuttering and stammering problem. I'm sure Nishani, you remember how you were called uh, to my class one and class two teacher to say Shara has no friends and she's sitting by herself. And the reason I had no friends is because I couldn't communicate clearly. I couldn't talk. I was very uh, weak academically and I was very lonely as I was very often bullied by other girls in, the school, in my class and older. And uh, when I got to a point of grade eight, you know, I uh, was really uh, low. But as I said, not everyone noticed that because it was a busy, happy family. Yes. And even in class, I was quite like the joker and things like that. But within myself, I had these uh, depressive thoughts. I thought of myself as nothing, as not being worthy. Uh, I thought of myself as um, that I wouldn't make a difference. Uh, in the in this world, because there's so many other people who are so out there, and um, I would often try, you know, to cut myself and things like that. And I remember um, trying to fill up the bathtub and 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 end it all there. But for me, Nishani, the turning point was I said, very angry to God and very deeply hurt. I said, God, if you are real show yourself to me because I don't feel worthy. I don't feel that I have purpose in this life. I don't feel that I am making a difference. And I feel actually like wasted space. And uh, Nishani, I felt uh, God say uh, to open the Bible and I read the scripture and you know it's my favorite scripture. It says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a people belonging to God. And then I realized that I am chosen to be his princess. He is the king of kings. Yeah. And therefore, I'm a princess. I have royalty. I am special that my father God loves me. And that I have a sense of belonging, you know, that even though I may not have fitted in with my friends, and at that point, I was still having such a communication problem, I couldn't even say speeches when it came to English orals, it was a nightmare for me uh, to go up and speak in front of people. And um, I realized I had a sense of belonging, just as I am with all my faults, with all my failures, I am loved. Yeah. And uh, I think that is a, such a crucial thing to realize who you are. Um, for me, who I was in Christ. Yeah. That was my turning point uh, completely. Yeah. Yes. And that's, that is absolutely true. That's so true. Yeah. 
Yes. Ishara, we are nearly at the end. Um, yes. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, do you have any other burning questions before we close? Um, Shani, I think that to conclude this, you know, you've, you've spoken so, um, so openly and honestly about your life, about all your uh, uh, steps that you have taken and you've exposed so much about yourself. And I just want to thank you for that. Uh, I, and I just know that somebody listening to this conversation will be helped. Nishani, what is your message of hope? My message of hope, um, that's a good one, because it's the seeds of hope. Um, but my message of hope uh, is that every single person comes into the fullness of God, the divinity which is in, within you. We are in a space where, you know, you may, you may not even think that you are worthy of that. You may not think like, ah, oh, what does God bother with me? But I just want to say to you, and I want to say to you very clearly, I see you. I see you, I hear you, your life matters, and I don't care how dark it is right now, I don't care what you're going through right now, I know this year's been difficult, we've all, you know, none of us can say never say never, because we've all been through things that we said we would never go through. We've all given up things that we said we will never go through. But I just wanna say is that I see you, and I value you, and you are loved, and you belong, you belong to a God who will give everything for you. And I just want to bless you today with hope because hope is the antidepressant. Hope, hope will light the way. Hope will give you purpose. So, and as long as you have breath, there is hope. And if you've lost someone through COVID and if you've lost someone through suicide in your life, somebody who's close to you, I just want to say to you, I said, you know what? I feel you. I feel you. And it's going to be okay. It really is going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Get rid, rid, rid of the religious jargon that you know and seek the God of the Bible because I'm telling you, there is no greater love than that. And there's no greater hope than that. Christ is hope himself. So that's my message of hope for each one of us. Thank you, Nishani, for that. Uh, just to end the session, I would like to read a scripture, and then I'm going to ask Nishani, if you don't mind, to close our session with, some, uh, with a prayer. Oh, sure, sure. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to read from Psalms 34, verse 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Yeah, thank you, Shara. And uh, let's pray, let's pray, guys. Lord, we, we thank you that you are our God. We thank you that you are real, that you are divinity, and that you are deity, but that you live inside of us, and that your spirit lives inside of us. Lord, we pray for people who have been through suicide, who have families who have uh, experienced this, people who are contemplating this, Lord, we ask that you will be close to the brokenhearted, that you will, that blank that you put around me, that you will put around people today, that they will know the reality of knowing a living God and living a life of purpose and living a life so free and so joyous, Lord. Thank you for joy, unspeakable in the midst of this year. Lord, we ask that you will bless the show and that you will bless everybody that needs to listen to it and that you will be our source, our guide, our hope always, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Nishani. Thank you. And thank you, Facebook Live um, viewers and YouTubers. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for your support. Um, please do get in touch. I'm going to put the numbers in the, in the uh, comments column. And also, if you, um, if you need any answers or if you have any questions or comments, please leave them. We will get back to you. Just also want to thank you, Ishara, for your time, for, for doing this and uh, for sitting in the seat. I know it's not easy. It's a bit of pressure, but, uh, but thank you. Thank you so, so much. We really appreciate you. God bless you. Yeah. God bless you. God make his face to shine upon you and may hope always light your way. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.